Okay, I'm just going to go down the line. So, Rowan, if you could uh, tell me what you started out doing at Horizon and what you're doing now, um, that'd be great. Sure thing, can do. So I joined Horizon when it was still Zencash back in 2017. At the time, I was running a, a mining farm and actually watching some of your videos. And uh, the incident that Rolf just described, where there was a kind of fairly significant problem right in the very, very early days, was what actually got me sold to try and jump in and help and participate. So that's kind of my origin story for Horizon. Uh, and I joined initially, actually, to help with business development in the UK. And uh, Rolf, Rob, Rosario, everybody else in the team effectively kidnapped me. And that uh, expanded my responsibilities a little bit. Yeah, we're so. like, you, you're competent and can accomplish things? We, we got work for you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And uh, JC, how about you? Uh, what'd you start, how would you start and what are you doing now? I just started out like anybody else with an interest in the project and uh, when I um, started looking into the privacy side of uh, Zcash and then you know I liked it but then I thought Z Classic was a bit better and then <laughs> similar to everything else like you, you know you have to pay people to make things uh, work and uh, progress so then uh, yeah I was really intrigued with the node concept and that actually paying people to run a full node as opposed to, you know, I, I originally ran a uh, uh, Ethereum node and, you know, that's starting to take a lot of space and not actually being paid for that. And then, yeah, so now I'm pretty much part of the furniture on Discord and, and support anybody who has any questions or needs help. Excellent. Excellent. And Rosario, you, you're demonstrating by wearing that shirt how the earlier influence was with Zencash and Horizon. Um, right. So, uh, you know, tell us, you know, where, what you started and, and where you're at now. So I started in, um, at, from my living room in South Carolina with Rob in 2016, uh, hearing about these crazy ideas and wondering why I don't have a normal husband that just wants to do something normal. And uh, I, I, uh, luckily, I, I had just uh, finished my, my career in the military, in the U.S. military, and I, I wasn't quite as uh, excited about my, my follow-on career. So I, I just found myself getting more involved in this crazy world of uh, anonymous developers and, and things like that. So that was my story. I, I, tip my toe and then I decided, hey, this is really cool. It's changing the world. I want to be part of it. And you are. You're a big part of it now, that's for sure. And Chronic, uh, I know you were there at the very beginning. How, how did you know, what you did with Zencash and then Horizon progress? Well, I was one of these anonymous developers uh, <laughs> from the very beginning. And uh, I mean, I got involved in, in the Z Classic community originally. And uh, yeah, like Rolf mentioned, we had a very rocky start and I was one of the people stepping up, um, working wherever I was needed uh, and yeah, for, for a while there, there were no developers other than us anon uh, anonymous guys and um, yeah, over, over time, um, it, it's a very interesting space, so blockchain is one of the few spaces where it is possible to um, achieve something staying completely anonymous, so Satoshi uh, proved that it's possible. I think the only other industries uh, where this works is maybe information security and, and gaming. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, um, originally I'm out of the privacy community and uh, always was interested in uh, privacy preserving technology like Tor and uh, encryption. And that is what really um, yeah, moved me into the space. Great. So, Rowan, you did uh, a lot of interviews with different YouTubers and crypto influencers and uh, formed a lot of partnerships. You had an ability to talk to many people in the, in the industry. Um, when you talk to them about uh, Horizon, what kind of things did they find most interesting that they encourage you to pursue or, or, or that they said was different? Yeah, it's a little jarring after talking about anonymous development, but I think probably one of the most kind of inspiring things that really resonated with uh, companies. A big part of my job in the early days was to get Zen listed on more than just Bittrex. Uh, so we, we listed Zen on basically all the, the primary exchanges. 
And the types of things that really resonated with those groups were the opposite of anonymous development, <laughs> which is a little bit funny for the follow-up, but um, really it was about the transparency. There weren't many projects in the space that were up on stage, admitting they had issues, and talking through not just what the issue is, but how they're actually going to proactively try and fix that issue. Uh, and I think that probably would have been the single most powerful tool in the chest, because it gave partners and it gave people the kind of confidence to partner with us or to work with us for a variety of different reasons. Oh, that's a good point. One of the things I think in the darker days I thought about that um, is that by admitting some of the problems that we didn't have to talk about the other problems too. But, <laughs> uh, but no, that's, that's, that's really good feedback. Um, uh, so, JC, you've been supporting um, you know, users on the Slack and then the Discord for, for years. And you also um, took the Inside Block Explorer and modified it so you could see which different um, mining pools were, were mining blocks. And we can get an idea of, okay, does one mining pool have more than 50% of the hash rate and you know, alert us to problems and, and things like that. Um, from your interactions with people in the community over the years, do you, do you see any trends of how the community changed, either geographically or in interest or any of those kinds of things? Yeah, definitely seen a, a bit of like ebbs and flows as far as the community goes. I've noticed that when the market is down, there's a bit more community engagement online. I guess people see it as a, uh, an avenue that they can pursue. I mean, when we, had, uh, when we were at the all time high, like it was, you know, People would complaining that oh why is it so expensive to you know get the the initial um, collateral for the nodes and it's like well originally it wasn't and this is part of the pro like the product of the way that the market has shifted and I think now that once we're coming back uh, hopefully out of this one then we'll have more a broader base of um, community from around the world. Good yeah and we see that with um, the the earlier panel of. Um, you know, those evangelists from all over the world, uh, because it helps to go out there and tell people what it is that you're doing, because uh, people, although we want to have people find us on the internet and, and in other types of things, by going out and engaging with people, it, it, it's a twofold purpose of, first of all, letting them know that you exist, um, and also finding out in the personal interaction what part of your message resonates. If you just try to create a message in a vacuum, it's, it's pretty difficult. Um, so, Rosario, uh, I asked you a question earlier, but you kind of skipped the second part. So, what are you doing now? I, I'm a Chief Product Officer at Horizon Labs, and uh, it's, it's been an incredible transformation. So, I started doing just anything with uh, Zencash or Horizon at the time, and eventually I migrated to my marketing, and I don't have a marketing background. So I quickly knew that I needed to hire a marketing team. And, and once I formed that team, I'm like, OK, let me go back to technology where I, I, I need to go. But uh, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun uh, building products with uh, Horizon Labs. Yeah, and one of the things I noticed early on is if you want to accomplish things, having good project management and then even better product management were, is, is, is a really good thing to have. So. Uh, it's great that you've taken your expertise and directed it towards that. Um, Chronic, so we started out with no servers. Um, and then I, I talked earlier about having the node tracking system and block explorers and other things like that. And so anytime there was anything that involved any, any type of hardware, we're just like, can you take care of it, please? Um, and then you got to interact with the software developers. And uh, you know, th there's a back and forth there. But so from starting out with no servers to where we're at now uh, in a complete you know, DevOps team, uh, can you talk about some of that transition and possibly some of the issues that we ran into along the way? Yeah, happy to. So uh, originally the, the vision from the start was always to introduce an incentivized node system. And um, Alan was the architect and designer uh, who came up with the secure node um, tracking and payment system. And, uh, I joined the, the development effort uh, about uh, one or two months uh, into development and uh, quickly saw that, yeah, the, the plan is to, to keep the system running for maybe half a year and then we'll be ready to move it onto the main chain. Uh, that hasn't happened until this day. <laughs> so uh, I immediately saw, yeah, we need to work a little bit more on scaling this up, making it more resilient. So we went from a single database in the back end and a single application server 
to a geo-distributed system with uh, multiple locations uh, with right now 14 uh, application servers and uh, a six-node database cluster in the back end. And um, I mean, this, this proved to be a good decision. Uh, so we were able to scale up to more than 50,000 nodes all over the world, uh, very decentralized. And we were also able to uh, handle one of the incidents you always plan for, but you never expect it to happen. For us, a third of our infrastructure burned down one evening when the OVH data center in uh, Strasbourg caught fire and completely burned to the ground. And uh, due to proper planning and uh, implementing disaster recovery procedures, we were able to yeah, spin everything back up in the course of two days and uh, the system stayed up, although with reduced capacity. But we were able to, uh, without any data loss, without any, let's say, major impact on the users, uh, restore. And um, yeah, so everything worked as, as designed. And uh, yeah, more, more recently, uh, the infrastructure team has been expanding and we're um, yeah, handling all of these sidechain workloads. So we're spinning up nodes all over the world, uh, globally distributed. So we are making sure that uh, all of the sidechains that we build are properly um, decentralized uh, for as long as, let's say, we in the beginning are the centralized actors. Uh, with the goal of uh, introducing the fully centralized model with an incentive system so that the decentralization will take care of itself. Excellent. Yeah, that's quite a lot of growth there. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that we have a bunch of different things that we wanted to do. In fact, we had developed an entire voting system that we were looking at deploying onto the main chain. But one of the issues with having shielded transactions is they take a lot more space in the storage database than uh, unshielded uh, transactions. And Zcash has gone down their own path to develop smaller shielded transactions. Um, and we're going down our path of saying that we're going to offload anything that's not basic transactions uh, and sidechain communication transactions from the main chain to a sidechain. And so for the last few years, that's been a really good answer to uh, any time if anybody asks us a question, you know, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? It's like, well, we, we got to do it on side chains and the side chains haven't been developed yet. So we're going to focus on side chains. And um, now that we actually have the, the, the protocol to go back and forth from side chains, we have a, a live running side chain, uh, the answers are coming back again to, you know, when's this going to happen? So I want to ask each of you, um, what do you think a good sidechain system, an application, which is essentially a blockchain running on its own with the entry point and exit point being Zen and having a full community of developers and support and things like that so people don't have to launch a product, but it is kind of its own blockchain and it can accomplish things and it doesn't necessarily have to have a wallet interface or a block explorer, but those are probably a good starting point. So, Rowan, what do you think a good sidechain for ZBF or uh, a third party to develop would be? And I'm going to ask each of y'all the same question. Cool. So for me, our mission really as a broader crypto space is to bring as many people as physically possible into the world of Web3, into crypto, into blockchain, into lots of different types of technologies. Uh, because we all know in this room the benefits they can bring. And uh, if you want to make people do something, the easiest way to do that is to make it fun. So for me, by far the top of mind use case that I would want to have a side chain dedicated to would be gaming. Uh, and if we think about gaming as an industry, something like three billion people in the world are gaming every week, every month, which is roughly 40% of the population. And uh, at the moment it's a 180 odd billion dollar industry. So having a side chain specifically designed for high transaction throughput with the baked-in privacy functionality that Horizon brings opens up a whole realm of PvP gaming that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Uh, and just to kind of double-click on that for a second, if you think about some of the kind of popular trading card games, whether it's something like Pokemon or Magic the Gathering, or even if it's something much more traditional like poker, if you're playing those with NFTs, you can't be competitive if everybody can see your hand. So I think privacy functionality in a gaming world with high transaction throughput from proof of stake as a side chain would be a fantastic way to try and really onboard the next million users, the next billion users. Okay, great. Yeah, and if y'all just want to continue that down the line, that'd be great. 
Uh, in Australia, we've got a, um, a whole bunch of old growth forests that are scattered around the place and they're protected. But they're, the government have been looking for a solution to actually uh, register either be it individual trees, the forests themselves or something. I could see that a side chain with that sort of utility where they could go in, register the providence, I guess, of the, of the, of the trees or anything like that would be, would be great. So, you know, in, I guess having it on the blockchain would be yeah, great. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a, a, a really cool idea, as is yours, of course, Rowan. Um, one of the, we talk about sidechains a lot and about implementing new blockchain technologies and there's, there's a couple things because if you're going to go against uh, an entrenched uh, system, perhaps the insurance system or uh, other things where a lot of people are making money on it and have an incentive for it not to change, coming in with an unproven blockchain system is, is a hard sell. So going for something that's important or growing so fast that people really want it and they don't have a solution yet um, is kind of, to me, the ideal space of, of developing a sidechain project. So both gaming, which is growing super fast, and you know, addressing old growth forests, pretty cool ideas. I mean, I've come up with all sorts of silly ideas and they, they get shot down, you know, like a, a cat ownership tracking sidechain and things like that. But, you know, even so, we see with, with NFTs. People are like with NFTs, oh, we're just, you know, saying we have ownership of JPEG. Yeah, but you're also developing all the tools to be able to say, I've got ownership. Here's how we buy it. Here's how we sell it. Here's how we keep from getting it stolen. And you do that on silly JPEGs, and then you can flip it over to a system um, that has more meaning uh, and can show big benefits against entrenched systems. Uh, my big thing is to try to displace government uh, departments. So I'd love to see car titles uh, be on NFTs and on, maybe on a side chain. Uh, and then we can get rid of the Department of Motor Vehicles. So anything that's paper with a stamp on it, I think is ripe for being replaced by an NFT and, and specifically side chain NFTs. Sorry, Rosario, I interrupted, but I'm sure you've got an idea for, for a side chain that should be developed. No, yeah, so, so all these make sense, and with the gaming one is, is uh, very interesting. We actually did a POC for a, a gaming side chain, uh, so it's interesting to hear from other uh, individuals that have uh, grown and, and are part of other uh, companies to kind of remind us, like, okay, what, what, what is really important out there for uh, potential side chains? So from my perspective, taking it uh, back to our origin of, of uh, what we were trying to accomplish, uh, I think having a DAO uh, for the Horizon ecosystem is extremely important. And of course, we've, we've waited along the way so we can have the, the right technology to, to launch that. Uh, so that's, that's one that I would like for the Horizon ecosystem uh, specifically. Um, and, uh, but we, we've been working on other types of uh, sidechain within Horizon Labs. Uh, we had another ZK audit, which was a, an auditing system that uh, used zero knowledge to, to provide a uh, privacy within those, uh, so revealing without, revealing the information without revealing the, the um, background of where it came from. So I think that's also an interesting use case that uh, with bringing anything that brings privacy, uh, transparency with privacy, I think could be a good uh, way of, of removing an intermediary, intermediary uh, of these uh, systems that we have in place just to make things more efficient, so. I think a DAO is really important. In fact, I remember that we were talking, I think we did a present, no, it was in Bogota, this was five years ago, and there was an Ethereum developer that was up there, he was just getting hammered by a bunch of the other Ethereum guys, and uh, I went and talked to him afterwards. I said, hey, you know, you really handled that well. He's like, oh, you're with Zencash. You know, one of the things that we've been looking at is how you're going to do your governments. We're really interested in that. So, a, uh, you know, decentralized, autonomous organizations, one of the things that we've talked about for a long time of having to do. And it's not like we have to put it in place and then, boom, all the decisions are outsourced to whoever owns Zen or whatever voting uh, things we set up. So there's a path to development, there's a path to rolling it out, and we start out with low impact things. So let's 
you know, create a, a DAO sidechain and enable voting as the first part of it, and let's vote on relatively inconsequential things and see how that goes. Can it be gamed? Can, you know, are, do we, does the community start to establish different political factions um, and, and start going against each other? And, and one, of, one of the things Rob has always said is he wants to see the DAO get to the point of that people are able to vote in different organizations that can provide services to Zen Blockchain Foundation. Because by gradually moving the, 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 the control and the ability to make decisions away from individual people and to the community, it makes it much more resilient and protective against any type of regulator attack or, uh, you know, to me, maybe even the, you know, big crime syndicate attacks, or there's all sorts of different attacks that can come from different directions. And there's certainly you know, network attacks, crypto attacks, but there's also political and personal attacks. And there's, there's a whole realm of things that we need to defend against. So uh, a DAO is a great idea. We've never given up on that idea. We just want to do it the right way, in a safe way, that gradually rolls out the decision-making process to the stakeholders of, of Zen. So Kronik, what's your idea? Yeah, so for me, the, the initial goals are still the, the most important ones. So we want to do voting, we want to do DAO, and we want to move the node tracking onto a sidechain. So um, node tracking onto a sidechain sounds easier than it is. Uh, we are verifying so many different things um, right now on a, on a centralized system, and it will be very hard to implement this in a fully decentralized model where essentially each of the nodes would have to validate each other. Uh, and uh, I do not believe that when we get to it that the, the nodes will, they will look different, but um, the, the vision is still to, to utilize these nodes for actual tasks. So we, we are building a, a huge ecosystem of many different sidechains, and uh, it is on us to, to utilize the nodes to be the resources that run all of these, side, uh, all of these sidechains. And uh, it is a, it's a huge opportunity for us as well to make sure that uh, we can offer uh, any client, even the infrastructure, and it will be uh, with the right incentive system, it will be self-sustaining, so that is uh, what, what I'm passionate about uh, as an infrastructure guy, uh, essentially having the infrastructure out there to run any workload you would like in, and be sure that it stays up and running. Yeah, to add to that, so we've got a great centralized systems for tracking that the performance capabilities of the nodes that are running the Zen code have certain amount of processors, certain amount of computation capability, certain amount of storage. Uh, we, they have to go and retrieve something from the blockchain within a given amount of time. And if they don't, they don't get paid that day. So there's a, there's a performance level uh, that we're able to do. And it's, I mean, we've got really resilient nodes. And if someone wants to attack our system, it's going to be really tough. Um, in moving to a sidechain based one uh, of having the nodes not only run the, the Zen code, but also run the sidechain application that tests the other nodes, we may have to back off all the awesome things that we're doing right now in order to implement that, that system, but I think it's totally doable and it'll be great to, to, um, to, to do that. Okay, so. Um, all right, you have, Rowan, you've had a chance to work with uh, some different projects in the last year, and you've uh, kind of expanded your uh, realm of uh, projects that, that you work with. And there's a lot of other multi-chain type platforms, and a lot of things run on top of Ethereum. So when we're talking to people about developing on uh, Horizon for the side chains, what advantages do you think we should emphasize? For me, something I've been talking about for quite a long time, probably the number one most important thing is interoperability. I think speaking to a, a large, in, in fact, I'll take a step back for a second, because I also, I did exactly what Rosario did. I skipped the introduction piece of, <laughs> of what I'm doing now. So just quickly, um, I took a step back from Horizon in 2019, I think, and uh, jumped into DeFi, and now currently head up uh, Web3 business development for Coinbase. Uh, and within that role, I talk to a ton of different companies um, and a ton of different projects that are building in lots of different directions. But uh, the ones that typically do the best are the ones that really have interoperability as a cornerstone of what they're building. Because if you're building in a silo, you are individually responsible for bringing everybody into your realm. 
And no matter how big your team is, that's a mammoth task. Whereas if you're interoperable with a variety of other chains and you have good infrastructure in place to enable bridging between chains, then you effectively doubled, tripled, quadrupled the size of your kind of outreach. Uh, so for me, that's probably the one piece that I think is most important. Interoperability with interoperability. other chains? Interoperability. Okay. Um, that's, that's complex and, and a big order to develop, and fortunately we have a really good team of great people that can do that. So well, EVM compatibility is coming very, very soon. I'm excited about that. Uh, so, uh, John Carlos, so I'm going to ask, this is something that uh, as a board member as EBF is a concern to me. Um, you know, we have our block explorer for the main chain, and we're going to have people running side chains. I'd love to be able to go to a dashboard and see how many side chains are running and what they're doing, and kind of, I don't know, maybe a little bit of something about them. Do you think our existing block explorer, the insight, can expand to take on the sidechain monitoring capability, or do you see that we need to maybe go in a, in a different direction to be able to get visibility into this type of stuff? Yeah, I, rec I reckon it could be adapted to, to accommodate that. I mean, similar other, uh, other explorers have a drop-down menu that you can select the individual sidechains to have a look at. You could also then just have an overall view of, you know, I guess, the number of transactions, the number of blocks that are being found by each of those. And you could do a comparison to see, you know, which one's performing better than the others or depending on, you know, their consensus models. Okay. Well, that's good to hear because that was kind of a, a big unknown for me. I, I was thinking that it was just going to be kind of like out there in the, you know, ether and not really knowing what's going on. I mean, from what I've, from what I've been seeing, people are, that's one of the metrics that everybody wants to see. They want to see, you know, how much TPS is out there. What's the TPS? What's the TPS? Well, <laughs> If you've got something that's readily available on one of the explorers that can give you, even give you a live update of like, this is how much is sitting in the mempool, this is what's doing this. I mean, it kind of already does that with the, the I guess, the automatic updating on the main page. But yeah, yeah I'm sure that it, it is completely feasible to do that. Okay, well, that's good to hear. So, Rosario, since the Zen block blockchain is a platform for sidechains, um, each of these sidechains, they're basically running their own project. Uh, they're running their own servers, they're running their own consensus mechanism, and things like that. And then third parties, they're going to develop side chains, but they have to have kind of a feeling that if they put all this time and effort and money expense into developing and running a side chain, that we as the, the folks at Zen can't just shut them down um, and, and make all their work go away. So uh, is that possible? If, if someone does develop a side chain, can we just arbitrarily shut it down or is that not possible? The beauty about the, our side chain design is that it's permissionless. So it's, uh, and this goes back to, to blockchain, right? So we, we wanted to make sure that we, we had a system that could not be, could, number one, anyone can, can use, so they don't need our permission to use. So you could go off and, and launch a side chain and that it, couldn't be affected or turned off, so so that's that's great. The next challenge for us is making that experience very seamless for developers because right now, quite honest, it, it's it's a, a very uh, challenge to to have uh, people use our SDK and, and blockchains are are like this. So as we go through this this uh, timing phase, it'll be how to make it very easy for developers just to uh, use our SDK and launch whatever they want to do uh, easily. Uh, and they're not trying to replicate uh, code that's already out there that they could go and, and copy, so. Okay, so if I wanted to launch we a gambling... We have a permissionless I, If system. I wanted to launch a gambling side chain, you couldn't shut me down? No. Nice. <laughs> okay. Um, we may have to separate ourselves a little bit. No, I'm not doing that. I was just a, a theoretical <laughs> other person. I, I don't have the skills to do that or the desire, but I'm sure somebody does. Uh, so, Chronic, I think that, you know, you joined the project. You still operate under a pseudonym. Privacy is pretty important to you. Um, so, although there's a lot of metadata tied to Chronic these days, I'm sure. Um, so, what are some of the things that you think might be enabled in regard in, for privacy regarding different sidechain applications for you know how can if, if people are going to be running a sidechain and someone wants to go use the application on that sidechain 
you know, they're probably going to be saying, well, is all my data going to be collected? Is all of it going to be tracked? How can people be sure or get assurances that if they're going to use somebody's side chain as a user, that they're not going to get, you know, that they're going to be able to maintain their privacy? Is there a way that a third party can maybe check that or validate it? I don't even know what the format of the question was, but I just want to be able to make sure that if people want privacy and run side chain applications, that we have a way that we can show them that they, it is. Yeah, so, so one interesting thing about the sidechain system is that uh, it allows us to keep a, a lean main chain. So right now we have shielded transactions on the main chain and uh, anytime we would want to introduce a, a bigger change to introduce, for instance, newer privacy technology from Zcash, it's a hard fork, it's uh, a three to four month engineering effort validation and the sidechain system can enable us in the future to move specific shielded pools into specific sidechains meaning there could be a sprout sidechain, a sapling sidechain, a blossom sidechain. So it gives us the flexibility to, to oh. iterate quickly. This is on the, let's say, purely private transaction um, use case. Yeah. Uh, but ZKP, ZK Snarks will also be able to uh, enable selective disclosure of information. First, you're able to, to prove some fact without revealing all of the details. This could be something like a uh, snark um, identity platform. You could say, you can prove uh, I am 18 and I'm of, uh, I have a valid driver's license without, let's say, uh, disclosing, hey, my address is this, I'm born here. So selective disclosure is uh, one of the very interesting use cases uh, that could be enabled on sidechains. And it has many applications to, to business problems, to, to medical data, to um, to government-run databases. So uh, all of this is, uh, is very interesting to, to implement with uh, ZK technology. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good point. So being able to set up uh, zero-knowledge proof circuits that do selective disclosure of information by proving the underlying truth of it but not disclosing all the private information is a big thing that's going to be enabled. That's awesome. Well, we're out of time. Uh, I know each of the folks up here, including me, would be happy to talk with any of you individually afterwards about Ralph, any of these types of things. Before so, we go, yeah. um, just because we have an amazing set of uh, panelists here, I would like to take a couple of questions. We have a few minutes, so anyone who would like to ask uh, any question to the real, well, some of the real Synogies right here, uh, please feel free to just stand up and, and ask a question. We can take two of them, so we we do have some time. Yes? Or uh, your favorite like breakthrough when working with Zen or Zen Cash or Horizon? Can you repeat the question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I know as someone who works with infrastructure, you've probably tackled a lot of difficult challenges in your days. I was curious as to what your biggest Eureka moment or like your favorite breakthrough along the way. Uh, favorite breakthrough uh, would, I mean, I think in terms of incidents, so I remember the, uh, the bad things and surviving the bad things. So there, there were uh, a 51 percent attack, for instance, which we all had to come together and, and come up with a solution. And uh, yeah, in 2020, the, the OVH fire. Uh, for me, it's, it's kind of a, a good thing if people don't notice us, the infrastructure team. If everything keeps running, then our job is, is done right. And uh, only when, when people start talking to us, it means something is wrong. And uh, so, yeah, uh, I mean, you prepare for the worst, you hope for the best. Um, uh, but I mean, the, the best thing is, is really the team, how the team has grown over the years, all of the great people we have found, all of the knowledge, all of the talent we have found. So that is what, what I'm most proud of. Uh, with Horizon and Horizon Labs. I'm just going to really quickly rephrase that question for Chronic. Which week, without any sleep at all, was your favorite week? <laughs> Chronic doesn't like to sleep. <laughs> Thank goodness for us. Right, um, yeah, we have one more. Hi. Um, this is uh, another question for Chronic. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I saw the team growing uh, during uh, last year that I joined uh, Horizon Labs, and uh, 
I uh, was asking why it's so difficult to find good DevOps in the industry. If you can tell us more. Well, DevOps is very, very sought after. So first, it's, uh, the, the market is, is pretty empty for DevOps because people are immediately hired, immediately picked up. So lots of cold calls, lots of recruiting. Uh, but also, it's, it's a very broad knowledge base that is needed because you need to know the, the development side. You need to know the operation side. You need to know security. Uh, so it is, uh, you need to be a generalist to work in DevOps. Yet, you still need to be proficient with, with many, many topics. So uh, development is needed. Uh, so uh, back-end engineers are, ne uh, are needed. Um, systems engineering is needed. And um, on top of that, blockchain. So I always say we, we don't hire blockchain engineers. We make blockchain engineers. And uh, it, it takes uh, a lot of time from, from finding someone that is very promising, that has lots of experience to, to actually build on blockchain experience. Uh, and uh, there are some people that are, let's say, blockchain native, uh, but they are very, very rare and hard to find. And yet, there's one thing I want to say about uh, the 51% attack that you mentioned. The 51% attack was a really defining moment um, for our project because part of it happened um, because it was a transition from GPU miners over to ASIC miners. And uh, NiceHash got involved. It was actually an attack on an exchange. And there was a bunch of different opinions internally of what we should do. Some people are like, no, let's keep the Equihash algorithm as it is. Other folks are like, no, let's change it so that GPU miners can mine for us again. We can keep that part of the community. And so there was a lot of different opinions internally. And we talked about them. We hashed them out. And then Alberto came up with the solution of having a delayed consensus. So we took care of the immediate solution by having the uh, deposit uh, time frame with the exchanges, which were the ones being attacked, lengthened to like a few hours. And then the longer root cause uh, fix was to implement and roll out the, the delayed consensus, which was unique in the industry. And other people copied it and, and used it afterwards. And we were able to maintain the, the same Equihash code, which means we didn't have to start chasing after a, a proof of work algorithm change every three months, which would have been the result of doing that. Um, and you know, I remember saying at the time, well, you know, maybe at some point we'll become so successful that we'll be the leading Equihash proof of work chain. And so things you know, take time, things develop, and that's still in the cards. So I just wanted to, that 51% that attack, I, I remember that as, as a painful experience as well. Um, and it really, that our system of dealing with a problem and coming up with a solution and moving forward together, which is an important part if you come up with a solution on a team. You don't continue the, the finger pointing and decision afterwards, you, you, you move forward together. Everybody was on the same page. Um, of moving forward with the, the delayed consensus algorithm. So that was a success to the hard-won methodology that we had developed over the previous years. And Ralph, Thanks. so what I uh, also remember for part of that experience and, and uh, was the, the initial response to it. So I remember it being, I think, uh, 2 a.m. And for some reason, I'm checking Discord. And Chronic's there uh, with another developer monitoring the, the blockchain and just identifying that something's not going quite right. Then we get into the mode of uh, contacting the exchange. I think Ro uh, Rowan did that. And right away, just working out through the mechanics of what the communication was going to look like, what are we going to do. And that was, um, from, from my perspective, a defining moment in terms of team, team dynamics where we, we really didn't have this rapid response or officially rapid response team but during that moment everybody came together and executed their function seamlessly and because we had been operating already very well together in this distributed fashion uh, just went ahead and and started that communication all resulting into okay we have this issue uh, we communicated with the exchange we uh, crafted a communication uh, with all of our users and then going into okay, Alberto's thinking, how do we fix this for, so it doesn't happen again? Because it, if it's something that can happen, it will happen. So how do we, how do, we do that? So that's um, a good reminder of, of where we came from and how we formed as a team. Um, so anyway, so thank you. No, that's you. great. And I think that's a great way to wrap it up.
Amazing. All right, let's give them a very big applause, everybody.